Thank you, Madam Judge, Judge Sebutinde, to this uh, very important and encouraging Institute of Cultural Diplomacy and the Interparliamentary Alliance. It is an honor to be here, not only because of the, of the room in which we are sitting, but also because of the symbolic uh, value of this uh, building and the achievements that it has complied, that it has fulfilled. And uh, uh, my words will not represent an official opinion of my country. I'm not speaking on behalf of my country. That will be a personal view on what I have called human rights law as a core subject of international law. This is something we all know, but I would like to share with you some reflections on this. Uh, first of all, why to raise questions about the place of human rights in international law? In the current context, it seems that human rights are part of a solid chapter of international law, and there is very little space to move into new courses. This theoretical assertion may be contrasted with analysis aiming to review human rights, uh, regimes, treaties, and their underlying principles. Both trends are present in our current situation, in the current circumstances. Reports and governmental declarations shed light on ongoing discussions about human rights approaches in particular areas, such as the need for new states' obligations and the emergency of a responsibility to respond doctrine, the effectiveness of treaty-based regimes, as well as the role of international tribunals, even criminal ones, and committees in this field. Recent initiatives to address issues on human rights and transnational corporations and business enterprises or to review the structure of the inter-American system of human rights are indicative of this trend. Nevertheless, the nature of the current discussion continues to be oriented by a central question. That is, whether human rights should primarily remain a matter of domestic concern not only in the sense conveyed by the term complementarity um, of the International Criminal Court statute, but also in the perspective of states' overarching compliance obligations. Still, the point seems to be to what extent international law and international mechanisms interact with sovereignties and if supranational structures, although limited, are able to function independently of the internal law dimensions of each and every country. Relativist and universalist theories compete at trying to provide guidance to different approaches toward human rights in the international sphere. Without necessarily upholding a relativist approach, it may be asserted that the international community, at least in its conceptual definition, is subject to stress due to the fact that context contextual interpretations sometimes seem to dominate the discussions about human rights in the multilateral stage. This may be not an ideal goal, but it is present in analysis over the value of democracy, the rule of law and governance, as preconditions of human rights, even in countries that have adhered to a democratic catalogue, such as the Inter-American Democratic Charter. This is not only a theoretical or rhetorical question, then. It is also a concern in the ongoing analysis related to institutions such as International Criminal Court, as well as uh, other international tribunals, which form part of regional systems to protect human rights. Does it mean that whatever role is ascribed to international law, especially in the field of norm creation and protection, its place in the human rights sphere is subject to conditions which may render it a mere ideal? It is worth noting that human rights promotion is essentially non-adversarial, and that it tends to reflect the perspective of a top-down activity, as many authors have said, through implementing policies and practices. It is then through the notions of respect, protection, and fulfillment in the domestic sphere of states that international law comes first to terms with its objectives. So far, international law, either regional or global, has had the virtue of promoting human development through peaceful change, rather than encouraging confrontation between international entities and sovereign states, to the fact that the latter continue to be key actors for the processes of law creating, monitoring, and reporting. Thus, there is a lot of space for interactions within concepts such as diplomacy, cooperation, and restoration, 
a suitable international scenarios supportive of human rights policies. When dealing with human rights states, it is usually raised the point, usually raised the point whether to opt for a loose supervision and avoid adopting structures that could lead to the enforcement of measures in cases of non-observance of human rights, or rather, to delegate more capacities to international bodies. It seems wrong to conclude that international law prioritizes the protection of the state as a sacred value by itself, and that state sovereignty only serves to raise fences against the power of resourceful institutions. In fact, sanctions are the last recourse, and there is a wide space for international law to act be before reaching that stage. Which are the issues then for discussion in a forum like this, at least uh, for me? First, the universality of human rights as declared by the United Nations Declaration, but no, not as an ideal goal arising from principles drafted as if they were binding, but also as a point of departure to set off from a pessimistic view according to which it is not possible to conceive a generally accepted view on vital questions related to human rights. Universality is a notion which needs some more consideration, either from the perspective of the density of what can be considered as universally agreed and accepted as binding, or from the perspective of the exercise of the powers of the supporting international uh, institutional structures at the international level, especially in critical circumstances. This is, for example, one of the challenges that the Human Rights Council of the UN, uh, among other instruments, always face. Complementarity is the other issue between the domestic institutions and legislation and the international legal framework should not be conceived as one-sided approach in which domestic jurisdiction is the predominant ambit. This is the, the virtue of the complementarity concept. Complementarity should operate in a way that gives strength to internal institutions and uh, their development both in terms of rights, but also in terms of obligations. Some will affirm that it is in the domestic setting where protection can be provided more efficiently and closer to the real problems of sovereign powers. Other analysis will be inclined to say that international law is the best common ground to provide not only values with transnational projection, but also able to overcome different views and cultural, political, and religious divisions. This is a very key question in our current uh, situation, world situation. The assessment of the impact of cultural and social context on human rights, norm creation, and its bearing on international legal standards is something relatively uh, recent. These are essential elements to understand the functioning of measures aiming to implement treaties that run counter discrimination policies as in the cases of the Convention on Racial Discrimination or the Convention on the Elimination of uh, All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, among others. Then, leaving aside the constraints and strengths of the diplomatic protection, which is an old institution to protect nationals abroad, it is important to see that there is a double subjectivity which is all, always uh, at, uh, at stake uh, in the international arena, the state and the individual, both subjects of international law and internal law. It is, not, it is not my opinion that the concept of human rights is supportive of an individualistic model only. This is rather a short-sighted view that, can, that must be outweighed by the idea that any person, notwithstanding the status, position, beliefs, is subject to a standard which ought to be respected. Thoughtfully, this has been called this is a, a, a very an old a known uh, uh, assertion. It is a standard of achievement. Definitions like those embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, like that, that the contain, uh, Article 2, uh, reflects this legal conceptual position. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedom, freedoms set forth in this declaration. No distinction shall be made on the basis so-so. Then Article 18 states, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion, so, and so on. This word not, uh, not only reflects a feeling of what the law should be, but the rather contains a substantive assertion of what actually positive law is. 
It appears sound to conclude that through institutions and principles, it emerges a clearer understanding of what the law of human rights means. Through a process of universalization, these principles may reach a status of, a agreed, of an agreed standard that nobody can reject or oppose. The question is then whether international law contains norms that give to those definitions already agreed a material life to be part of the corpus juris of any internal society. The aim to protect natural persons against their own states and in their own environment is a key question. This is a huge step for international law and for our civilization, where sectarian religious or cultural notions compete with the universality of human rights. Among the targets of international law that have been set out since the declaration, the Universal Declaration, let alone the uh, pre-existing norms uh, on humanitarian, uh, humanitarian law or law to protect minorities, the concept of protection of all persons remains essential uh, in our present times. Different assertions provide elements to interpret and enrich the concept of what is protection. To protect does not only means, uh, mean to provide ways of exercising the rights defined and accepted as applicable. It is also the establishment of operative means to assist those who are in a situation where non-observation of human rights may occur or when the general pattern of conduct is the disrespect of human rights. It is useful to remind that the Committee on the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has stated regarding the discharging of this obligation that uh, any any state, every state party has a legal interest in the performance by every other state party of its obligations. So it's a, it's a common uh, obligation or a shared obligation embodied in that uh, covenant. The committee continues and states that from the erga omne status of the obligations embodied in the covenant and as well as in the UN Charter and the observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms, the contractual dimension of a treaty involves any state party to it being ob obligated to every other state party to comply with its undertakings under the treaty. And the committee says that to draw attention to possible breaches of covenant obligations by other state parties and to call on them to comply with their covenant obligations should, far from being regarded as an unfriendly act, be considered as a reflection of legitimate community interest. In this regard, it has been proposed that international law should evolve and allow for a transformation of ordinary norms to the fact that private actors be subject to international obligations assumed by their national states when abroad. This is a new uh, conception that to me is taking too much place, although it is very important because it is up to the state to strengthen the, the, the uh, uh, policies and to be able to develop the policy to protect, uh, to give protections in, in the human rights uh, field. This is a proposal that may have particular consequences for cultural, economic, and social rights. Again, the discussion about the legal foundations of the power of the state to extend its prescriptive jurisdiction beyond its borders may also come up and will have to be analyzed. Domestic and international deliberations continue to be influenced by diverse views about the place of the individual leader at the central piece of any society or as a unit of a mankind composed by a conglomerate of individuals as members of a group. From the perspective of international law, this discussion cannot pass an attendant in particular when this could lead to different approaches and methodologies of action. Two perspectives, one based on a more normative basis and the other on a more sociological one, normally interplay between them to a point where, where it can be asserted that in any situation where human rights are at stake, the relationship between the individual or group and the institutionalized power of particular states becomes very relevant. In other terms, a simple and clear separation between the context and the norm cannot be left to operate as if they were separate spheres. On the contrary, a serious effort to make human rights more universal needs to take into account the power and the cultural setting in which the said rights are to be exercised and enforced. In this respect, 
the distinction between civil and political rights and social, economic, and cultural rights, as depicted in the Covenants of 1966, has shown to be very substantive, not only in terms of law, but also in terms of diplomacy. No other subject seems to have been more difficult to study and define the sphere of human rights as this distinction. Among them, whether civil and political rights, as defined by the Covenant, reflect also a generally agreed view regarding the means by which a state can discharge its own duties. The same applies to the economic and cultural rights, which, in addition, pose a question of enforceability. As it has been affirmed by the Human Rights Committee uh, of the Civil and Political Rights Covenant on matters related to the denunciation of the Covenant, the rights enshrined in the Covenant belong to the people living in the territory of the state party. This is an assertion which is a very serious one uh, in terms not only of uh, the application of the Covenant, but also its uh, more, uh, in, uh, in the more uh, important and essential interpretation. Again, the dichotomy between sovereign powers and domestic norms and the duties and limits posed by the international law, uh, it becomes easier to conceive the interplay between states and the possibility of accepting universal human rights and the erga omne status, let alone the use cogens connotations. Uh, I mean, when you, we take uh, 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 jointly or in conjunction the sovereign powers and domestic norms, uh, we have to go ahead and to conceive the interplay between, the interplay between states and the acceptance of universal human rights, how they interact or how they interplay. Without supporting its valid, the validity of the contested doctrine of an alleged right of humanitarian intervention, it must be analyzed not only, this must be analyzed not only as a means of interference within the domestic order of a state, but as a response to facts characterized by a serious breach of human rights obligations, appealing to the enforcement of legal and valid means to counter them. This is the moment in which this interplay between sovereign powers and domestic norms, the protection of human rights, is very, is, should be very seriously taken. On the other side, the core economic, social, and cultural rights pose a question about the, uh, que the power that the committee has, or the committee of the covenant has, and state have, uh, uh, in respect of the assessment of the, the obligations to ensure satisfaction, or at very least, at the very least, of a minimum essential levels of each of the rights incumbent upon every state party. If in one case we have the situation of political rights and sovereignty seen, uh, seen from the point of view of the powers uh, of the state, then the economic and social rights, it is the question of which are the core obligations that any state should support. The committee has said if the covenant were to be read in such a way as not to establish such a minimum core obligation, it would be largely deprived of its raison d'etre. By the same token, it must be noted that any assessment as to whether a state has discharged its minimum core obligation must, must also take account of resource constraints applying within the country concerned. And this is a very important factor to take into account nowadays because of the, this discussion about the cultural division or distinctions that should be made in the way states uh, approach uh, their obligations in the international sphere obligations uh, in the area of human rights. The city of human rights, is it changing? The answer is that it's certainly not at a standstill in this respect. This is what comes out of the observation of various, various initiatives, such as the idea of a convergence between business and human rights, to which I have already referred to, through the connection between responsibility and respect of human rights, and the determination of uh, treaty-based mechanisms to hold a dialogue between them. That is a question that will have to be developed further. Another question arises from this analysis, which is the role of international tribunals and their capability to address subjects in which human rights considerations are essential. 
the still young International Criminal Court and other international criminal tribunals, as well as human rights tribunals, have provided responses uh, either uh, in respect of uh, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or breaches of international law attributable to the states and committed against persons. Are these examples of responses regarding remedies that international courts, are these the examples of uh, the remedies that international tribunals uh, should provide? Even a tribunal like the ICJ may be called to rule on human rights connected uh, to issues uh, in interstate relations, as we have seen in the morning. There were some references to, uh, to that um, made by Judge Sebutinda and Judge, Judge Tomka. In this respect, the punitive or reparatory power of international tribunals appear uh, uh, very noteworthy, and as such, it should not be signaled as a barrier for cooperation. Other questions may be raised in this ambit where the International Criminal Court struggles to reach universality, which is another um, uh, sphere of uh, analysis, and to consolidate itself as a backbone of the fight against cross, cross violations of the law of war or of crimes against humanity or genocide. On the other hand, it is the catalog of human rights and related institutions that pose particular questions in theory and in practice, either for general international law of a regional law. One question that raises our attention and that should be underscored is the adjustment process that domestic law has to endure to keep pace with international legislation and jurisprudence at this moment. This is not a new phenomenon, but uh, what is of interest nowadays as something that is happening in the European, inter-American, um, in the African uh, region is that any principle has to be internationally, internally declared and acquiesce in order to get the attention of governments and international tribunals at the same time. What emerges from this assumption is that international law not only counts in the international sphere, but also at the domestic level where national courts may be called to decide. This is also the test for the doctrine of the margin of appreciation, which promotes diversity and encourages the search of the best techniques through which to reconcile the conduct of national entities and international obligations. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, to summarize and to end with my presentation. There is an ongoing discussion about civil, uh, economic, political rights, economic rights, and specific areas in which these obligations are at stake, not only at the domestic setting, but also in the multilateral setting. And states have to participate in spheres in which they are not opposing other states, they are just reporting to the international community. And this is an area in which international law has to uh, play a role, not only politics. And uh, important to, to convey this me message. It may happen, this is my last uh, assertion, may happen that state sovereignty should continue re uh, to redefine itself. But this is a process which may prove to be a non-linear one, but it has to continue. Thank you very much, and thank you for your attention.